Hi and welcome to another episode of the Getting Things Done podcast from Vital Learning. I am Morten Røvik and I am here as always with my good friend and colleague Lars Rotskill Hendriksen. Privet Lars! Privet Morten, good to see you as always and as always good to be with our listeners and viewers out there. We always start off with a quick reminder of the purpose of this podcast, which is to help you learn GCD or become even better GCDers. I'm sure today's episode will help you with that. If you're new to GCD, we always recommend you go back and listen to episodes one through six to get an introduction to the basics of GCD, the five steps. Today's episode number is number 114 of this podcast, and today's episode is about the new book, Team Getting Things Done with others indeed it's an interview episode where you uh, have interviewed david allen and ed lamont the two authors uh, of the book and um, i am very curious to hear what they have to say about the new book so just to set things straight it's called team getting things done with others that's the correct yes. title isn't it yes yes okay are you ready to roll the interview? <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, okay. Roll. And now, our special guest. It is my great pleasure to welcome not just one, but two guests on the podcast today, which I think is a first for us. Um, both Morten and I have known you for many years, but in my preparation for this interview, I, of course, Googled you both. And um, according to Google, we have with us today one author and one American author. <laughs> Not sure about the dis distinction between the two, but I'm very happy, first of all, to say hi to author Ed Lamont. Ed, how are you doing today? Wonderful. That would be a Canadian author. Um, perhaps I should, I should add that into the description. Um, we we I need am... to fix that with Google. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm very well. I'm a little bit tired. I've just come back uh, from a week in the bush, learning uh, learning bushcraft skills, and and interestingly, uh, some very interesting teaming stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm well, um, very satisfied, if slightly tired. <laughs> Fantastic! Thanks for being here, and a hello to the American author, David Allen. How are you doing, David? Hi, Lars. I'm absolutely fine. Thank you very much. It's a little rainy and a little chilly here in Amsterdam mm. at the moment. And and I have a dog trying to get on my lap. <laughs> you know, one of the, one of the hazards of, of uh, animal husbandry. But uh, anyway, no, I'm fine. So thank you and thanks for the invitation. <laughs> Delighted to be here. No. Always happy to chat about this stuff. Yay. Yeah, great, great, and that's a that's a different team, I guess. You and the you and the dogs as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you are both co-authors of the new <clears throat> new book team, getting things done with others, which came out in May. David, of course, wrote the uh, book, getting things done, and Ed, you've worked with you know GTD professionally for many many years, training, coaching, consulting, uh, co-founded GTD. Um, what was it? Next Action Associates in Great Britain and Next Action Partners in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, if I remember correctly. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time here with us. Um, I can imagine there are a lot of activities also with the uh, the book. I know that especially for you, David, because you just did a big speech and some uh, some workshops in Denmark at a conference called President's Summit in Denmark just uh, a few weeks ago, which was a lot of fun for for me to attend. Um, so happy that you're taking the time to talk to us a bit in this uh, in this episode, where I hope we can touch on a bit about the book uh, itself, of course, some of the principles in the book, and in the end, also some practical tips for our listeners to try out. So I will dive in right away with my first question, which of course is, how did the book come up? How did you decide to, to write it? Well, we were, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, um, I mean, there's a, there's a whole gestation period, I think, uh, prior to us actually having a conversation about it. But the, but the conversation was, was really about um, just no, noticing that there was a bit of a gap in, in the GTD canon, if you like, insofar as we were both working for, for many, many years uh, with individuals. 
and you know largely successfully with individuals teaching them the the, the skills of personal productivity um, and then noticing that very often they were they were having to go back from a seminar where they were all lit up about possibilities into teams and structures that really didn't work for them and um, it wasn't that they couldn't practice GTD they could and the best of them did um, but even they were kind of just playing self-defense uh, a lot of the time instead of being able to get on with the bigger things that would be possible if their team was a better structure. Um, and the, the realization that kind of came after the conversation was that you can't fix those things with just more and better individual productivity. There's something that needs mm. to happen at a different level for that to happen. So, so there was, there was that, the noticing of the gap and then also just kind of a, uh, inherent frustration, uh, about not being able to address more of the problems that people were experiencing in their in their daily work um and then the decision was to you know to work on the team structure as opposed to the organizational thing because uh that's such a big beast that um it may it may be the stuff of of a next book who knows but um it's for for now we just thought we can probably do something uh fairly effectively and uh, allow that, so that teams can do quickly um if we work at the team level mm. great yeah i noted that as well in the uh, interview you did with uh, todd and, and robert's podcast uh, where you were talking about teaching gtd to people but sending them back into teams where you know that that self-defense description that really really stuck with me um so now the book is out and um I'm curious to hear your expectations uh, for it and, and perhaps allow me to start with mine. Um, they, I think it's, this is the book that many GTDers out there have been waiting for. Um, you know, they, you know, they have their GTD practice in, in place, helping them to succeed in their organization, or at least keep their head above, above water. But now with the teamwork uh, or the team book, they have a framework to, to think about when it comes to collaboration with others. So this is now my chance as a GTDer out there to, you know, influence and help my colleagues with the best practices from GCD on a, on a team level. Um, and I think this will introduce many more people to GCD and I think perhaps inspire them to become GTDers, which is, of course, great for everyone out there. What are your expectations? Now that I've set mine <laughs> really high, what are your expectations for the book and, and its effects out there? Over to you, David. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make a stab at this. Much like when I wrote Getting Things Done, I had no idea how popular it was going to be. I just had to get it out of my head. I had to capture, mm. you know, 25 years of my career and everything I'd learned about it and just stick it in a manual as I got good coaching that, that, that I should do that. I had no idea. But again, I think the combination of, of high aspiration and no expectations is kind of, <laughs> you know, where I am with all of the work that I do. It's like, yeah, that'd be cool if that happened or whatever. And, you know, I'm okay if it's not. I just think this needs to get out of the world. And maybe, you know, 50 years from now, somebody picks up the book from, you know, some time capsule or whatever and reads it. Oh my God, you know, how cool is that? So at least it's out there as a, as a methodology. So that's kind of mine, you know, at age 78 in my career right now, it's not like I need this book to really work in order to keep my career going. Uh, and, but I'm excited that we did this and that it was a big, as Ed mentioned, it was a big gap that needed to be filled. So um, just be, you know, kind of insanely curious about what the uptake is going to be. So, mm. No idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm with David. Uh, high hopes, low expectations, um, just because expectations tend to lead to frustrations and resentment. So I'm not, I'm not keen on those. Uh, but would love for it to obviously to sell well. Um, you know, it's it's been an investment of uh, several years of research and effort, um, and uh, it would be great. And, and we we actually wrote this stuff up. We wrote a lot of the book using the principles of the book, sometimes consciously, sometimes just because it felt like the right thing to do. And then we realized, oh, we just did the thing that we were you know we're proposing people do. Uh, we did write up, you know, our, our vision for it. And one of them was that this, this book would, 
expand the, uh, the field uh, really for people to practice GTD on an individual level, but also to, you know, start to shift teams. Um, and that's why, you know, we defined teams so broadly um, because it would be a shame for, you know, only people working in large organizations to get GTD and, and get mm. the team uh, a la GTD. Um, so we, we defined teams quite broadly so we could, you know, catch non-conventional teams and help them as well. And mm, yeah. I think also uh, we, what, what's fascinating is, you know, for, I don't know, 100,000 years or more, uh, people have gotten things done with other people. And, and yet there hasn't been a manual about how that really works on a universal scale. Meaning a hundred years from now, 10 years ago, whatever, what really worked when things worked to get things done. And, and we all get things done with other people. I don't care how, you know, much of a, <laughs> of a hermit in the woods, you know, doing your own art or writing your own book or whatever, you're still going to need somebody to express it, to get it out there, to, 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 to cooperate in order to make it happen. And yet nobody's really, at least the best we could see, nobody ever written a real manual about this. That wasn't, you know, uh, tied specifically to a kind of a team like in a pharmaceutical company or in an aerospace company where you have to, you, you have projects that have a team template about how we do this or whatever. But, you know, years ago, I did a lot of, I, I, I've struggled around to find out, okay, who's got, who's got good models about how do you work together as a team in terms of project management, in terms of other kinds of things. And frankly, nobody had it. Nobody had figured that out. And, and still, maybe somebody else had, but I think Ed and I did a pretty good job of nailing it down. Hmm. Yeah. One, the, the, one, in terms of uh, you know, high hopes um, and on sales, I, someone sent me a text. I, I don't know if you know this, David, but uh, someone sent me a text over the weekend, which was to say that we are currently number two on the hot releases in Amazon. Um, so I would prefer to be number one after a week after release. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm okay with number two. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. Nice. Yeah. And so one just reviewed in the wall street journal, by the way, Ooh. by a woman. And she ended it with saying, this is a really good book, not a great book. And in a way I went, I wonder why she said that. Well, it's obviously a critic's spin. They try to, you know, make themselves unique or, or, or say something, you know, provocative about whatever they're critiquing. But I don't think Getting Things Done was ever seen as a great book. I think they were seen as a good book. And I think good is probably better than great. There are a lot of great books out there and they have a very short lifespan. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so I think good it's probably as good a, a recommendation for this book as anything. It's like a good manual. That's really good. It's not a great manual for Word or for Teams or for whatever. <laughs> but it's a good one. Yeah. So, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. One thing that I was curious about as you spoke about this now is the how people will find this book, pick it up, perhaps differently from the Getting Things Done book, because Getting Things Done is a lot about personal productivity. And this is more on a team level. And at least in, in, in my work over the years with GCD, sometimes it can be more challenging to pick up the book that is about you as opposed to the book that is what can we do as a team. Because then it's it's not about you personally; it's about the the team instead. I don't know if you've thought about this or any 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 reflections on that. Well, I, mean, well, I think that we go ahead, Dave. Yeah, well, we acknowledge that. Come on, if you're a soccer player, if you're if you're a football team, you need individuals who have great capabilities. But you then also that's not enough. You need to know how to work together as a team. 
in terms of your mechanics of how we practice, how we work together, how we engage together, how we strategize together. And that isn't handled at the individual level, but you need the individuals who have the capability of doing that. If they, if you don't, then you can have the best strategy in the world, but things are going to fall through the cracks and that's not going to work. So you need both. That's mm. why we tried to address this, you know, in, in sort of the multiple ways that you need the combination of, uh, of high performing individuals who know how to then play together in a high performing way. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, we, we, we sort of wrote the book with the initial idea of, hey, we're going to get this out to people who are already practicing GT and want to do it, you know, do it better at a team level. Uh, I suspect a lot of the people who pick the book up will uh, not necessarily be those people. Like we, we really wanted it to be um, something that would be accessible to people who knew nothing about GTD. I, I hope we were successful with that. Um, and I think you're right, Lars. I think that uh, a lot of people will buy this book because they're so frustrated about their team um, and they will want to uh, get their team fixed. And what they might find in that process mm. is that, you know, when you're pointing, uh, you know, classically, if you're pointing one finger at the team, you've got at least three fingers pointing back at you uh, and that they'll go, oh, I need to work on my personal stuff as well. But um, a I think you're right. A lot of people are going to be experiencing frustration at the team level that they're not experiencing about their own productivity because, they're they're not really aware of what's possible in the domain of personal productivity so they think they're they're doing really well and they're frustrated with their team members um hopefully the book will give them that but also some sense that hey i need to do some work myself mm, yeah so I'm we've already curious, touched uh, 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 yeah. Lars, one of the things i think we're running up against is people are in their comfort zone with how their teams are working and not working. I think a lot of teams don't realize how suboptimal their functioning is. And I think mm -hmm. we tried to address that as well, but that's one of the things certainly Ed and I have noticed is that a lot of teams are just, oh, well, that's the way we've done it. We always have Monday meetings and always three or four people don't show up and always people have two or three digital devices in front of them that have nothing to do with the meeting. That's just the way things have been. And we're still okay. You know, we're still functioning. We're still a, a company. We're still a team in a way. And most people don't realize what they're missing <laughs> mm. because of that. Mm. Absolutely. And, and, and I can certainly recognize that it's one, it's been one of the fun things to notice over the years or oh, fun might be the wrong word. Interesting things to notice over the years of working with different clients is what are the you know, standards for meetings? Like you say, when, when do people show up? Do they show up five minutes before and have their agenda ready? Or do we start five, 10 minutes past the, the hour to then go through whoever speaks first or opens their mouth first? Right. Um, it's, um, and, and people just, you know, for the most part, just recognize, yeah, that's, that's just how it is. But, yeah, for many people, things can can get better. Like you said, hopefully the book can can help with that. So moving into the contents of the book, we've already touched a bit on it now, but how would you sort of describe the book overall? Uh, perhaps highlighting a favorite part, if you if you have one. Yeah. Well, um, I would call it a great book, um, but I'll 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 live, I'll, I'll live with good, um, yeah, which is which is so much better than all the other possibilities really um <laughs> and uh you know i i think that th there's a few parts of the book that I, we structured it in it, there's three chunks to it one is kind of like what's the what's the field of play um you know what's the current situation what are the problems that teams are experiencing um and you know what it, what is a team that's kind of section one section two we get into the um Kind of the extension of the original principles of gtd into the team environment and then at the end we're looking at you know if you're managing a team leading and managing a team uh, here are some things you might want to think hard about uh, leadership delegation and and being able to uh, prioritize or say no consistently enough that the team has some hope of not just sinking in a mire of overwhelm um, so that's how we, how we structured it. Um, and, um, 
there, there's a lots of pieces of the book for me. I, I guess a, there's a few personal favorites. One would be the working standards chapter. I think it's, um, mm. it's a place where I think we were able to add significantly to the discussion on organizational culture and what it is and how to change it uh, in a fairly granular way without uh, huge corporate initiatives. Um, you know, you can, you can make it fairly, I think you can make changes quite quickly to team culture. Um, you know, again, organizational culture, that's a different beast, but I think at the level of the team, you can get really, really important stuff done very quickly. Um, if there is any will at all to improve performance. Um, I also, you know, I think the the other chapter that's extremely important is the one on on saying no, because there really is no way to go forwards and uh, preserve the health uh, and sanity of your team uh, unless someone, um, and in, indeed, ideally, everyone on the team, being able to say no to stakeholders uh, in service of getting the important stuff done. And then the the idea that underpins it all um, is is in that first section in the intro is the the idea of healthy high performance um, and that 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 is behind basically everything we wrote was how do you achieve healthy high performance not just high performance without health not just health without performance but how do you do them both. Um, those I think are, I mean, my personal favorites, there's, I could go on and on and on, but if you, if you forced me, then those, those are the things I would highlight. <laughs> David, any favorites? Um, I think uh, to, to echo Ed, actually, a little bit about the standards and the fact that, you know, over the years, over the last 40 plus years with my company, Actually, sitting down, <laughs> Catherine and I, my wife and I, were on a plane flying to uh, Chile, actually meeting with some people that we wanted to engage with. And we said, you know, we've just now sort of created our new company. Uh, what would bother us if it didn't happen? We, you know, we, we sort of assume we, we, eat, we, we both had the same kind of standards about how we do things and what's important to us and what matters. We said, but I don't think everybody else necessarily shares that or at least knows that about, about us. And since they're going to consider us the founders of whatever this thing is, probably a good idea to let them know what would bother us and what would turn us on in terms of standards. And I think a lot of teams have never gone to that level of uh, subtlety and perhaps importance and, and motivation about, Hey, you know, let's work together as a team so we all grow together. Even if the team gets canceled because of other changes that go on, we learn something about each other and about ourselves and, and how to work together just in the process. So things like that, that's pretty subtle stuff in terms of a standard. So I think we tried to address that at least a little bit, uh, that there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for teams to motivate themselves better and mm. turn themselves on better and have a, have a richer kind of environment as opposed to being driven by latest and loudest and, to, you know, and whatever teams are driven by. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate that. The, <clears throat> certainly the standards part is interesting and also the saying no part. I really appreciate that we have that also in the level one seminar that this is actually a skill that's focused on and was highlighted in my most recent seminars. You know, it's it's so interesting to show up for a seminar called Getting Things Done and we, we actually focus on that and actually focus on many more things as opposed to just uh, what people perceive often to be just be more productive, produce more. Um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I have noticed myself, so you were kind enough to share the book um, with us earlier this year and we, we read through it. And, and one of the things that I find myself referring back to frequently was um, was the delegation part. So looking at my projects, looking at my next actions, looking at my areas of focus with the lens of what can only I do. Um, I don't know, David, I'm sure this has come up many years over the, <clears throat> many times over the years uh, in, in coaching others, perhaps, or, or where have you seen this most? Yeah, well, I, you know, a mentor of mine taught me, you know, uh, uh, some of the key elements of getting things done, which was basically get stuff out of your head 
and then take the stuff you've got out of your head and make decisions. What is it? Is it actionable stuff in it? So if you can finish in two minutes, do it. If you can't finish in two minutes, are you the right person to do this? Can you hand it off? Not do you like to, are you comfortable with, but can you hand this off? <laughs> and so I got trained in that you know, 40 years ago. And we, this is pre-digital, you know, I, we just had a paper-based form template that if somebody needed to hand it off, they would just write out the memo, put it in their out basket, and then go out. And they were amazed. The next day, they, stuff would come back. Done. The needle moved forward. <laughs> wow. Who'd have thought? But if it was only try, trying to, you know, kind of uh, coax people into, wait a minute, can someone else do this? Maybe not as well as you, but can someone else handle this? Because you got enough on your plate. And so I learned that years ago. Yeah. And then and the, the only do what only you can do is uh, was just something that came out of uh, coaching and seminars that I was doing um, mm. around the turn of the century. And um, it became clear that anybody who was in a leadership position um, had way too much to do. And they uh, there, there was a, always a, kind of an emotional pull back to what they were good at. Um, and they were avoiding doing the things that they were less comfortable with. Um, and there was a whole host of things that, that the team needs them to do that nobody else can do on the team. No one else has the, the, the juice, the relationships, the, the, uh, the, the kind of the stakeholder, um, uh, influence that the leader has, um, and so, you know, kind of only do what only you can do. But if you think about it, it's not just for leaders, right? It's it's for everybody, not not as a a rule, but it's a useful filter to just lay that over whatever you're looking at and and ask the question. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that so many times over the years in the seminars where this this delegation question coming up in the clarifying flow really has made a, a big difference for people. And perhaps we need it even more in Denmark than in other places, because I noticed my iPhone auto correcting delegation to relegation when I was making notes for this. I don't know. Perhaps we need this uh, this even more than than other countries. Um, we, <clears> the it's, other it's, it's, it's an interesting one because I think um, if, if we move a, a little bit away from just the, the principle of it and we go to the emotions of it, um, mm. I, I think that uh, as individuals living in a somewhat chaotic environment, right? It's, 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 it can feel that way when we're out, out in the world, right? This, this, this environment is less like it's very, very chaotic and sometimes very unfair. And so we all, I think, there is a real um, desire for control of our environment. Um, and so, you know, we end up sort of bending ourselves out of shape to get control. And one of the things about delegation is that you have to give up control. And that's one of the reasons that I think people struggle with it so much is that they, you know, they have their own standard and they don't feel like uh, their standard will be met. Um, and that they're going to lose control over, you know, whatever quality or customer satisfaction if they don't do it themselves. But what they don't realize is that they basically will put the brakes, they will slam the brakes on their own career if they do not learn to delegate very early on. Hmm. Yeah. And, yeah very good point. and then it comes back, Lars, as you know, back to people's personal capabilities of managing their own work. So, you know, if, a, if an executive is not taking notes, if they're not keeping an agenda list for things they need to talk to people about, if they're not keeping a waiting for list of things they're waiting on from other people, then they tend to then react to things blowing up instead of showing up, as opposed to conscious, you know, uh, constructive conversations. Hey, Jose, look, uh, Tell me what, I, I, you know, I've given you these four things. How are you doing on that? Do you need some help? Uh, do we need to take something off your plate to make that work? I mean, these are very healthy, mature kind of discussions to have, but, you know, that's missing if the individuals themselves don't have their own personal act together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I've seen that from a practical perspective as well. You know, being a GCD out there as a as a project manager in, in an IT project, I can I can absolutely recognize that. Moving on to some practical tips as well. So we, like I said, I really think this book is an opportunity for for the GCDers out there to to try to to share more best practices from from GCD, and we want, of course, to give some some practical tips as well to the listeners and, and viewers out there. And one thing that, that that I keep finding myself coming back to this this thinking also in seminars is this um, collaboration, the the thinking behind the the uppercase and lowercase projects that you that you mentioned. I don't know. Perhaps you can can elaborate on, on that one, Ed? Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it actually, I'd love to say it was, uh, you know, a uh, child of, of my mind or our minds. Uh, it was actually, I mean, most of the book, let's be really clear, is based on uh, interviews with, it's, it's our experience, obviously, but we, we also worked with about 65 um, GTD leaders, um, but by and large, they were mostly GTD practitioners who were also leaders, some of whom were leading quite large structures um, <laughs> that were, you know, we're calling still teams. Um, and it was one of our clients, actually, who said that they had found this way to distinguish between the, you know, big P projects and small P projects as a way of working out where does this need to go so that um, you know the individuals know what they're doing, but the team knows what it has on. So the you know the big P is kind of the classic um, something that might need prints too kind of project, a big mm. team project. Uh, whereas the small P projects were things that belonged in individuals' GTD systems, um, and and they just found this is a really easy way to. Um, have conversations about pro projects that you wouldn't want to try and do all of the team projects at the uh, personal project definition level, right? You'd end up with just a massive, massive list. So um, it was just easier to have a definition which uh, allows for a manageable list at the team level, but still keeps everyone focused while managing the GTD project definition style down at the individual level. Hmm. Yeah. One other thing that I noted, um, and I see that we have lost the connection to David, there were some uh, concerns about the uh, internet connectivity going uh, up and down with some uh, work being done on the cables there. So hopefully he will find his um, his way back. Um, one other question that I had for, for you, Ed, was, um, this work with teams, some practical examples of this. You mentioned that this comes from a lot of interviews. I'm sure there must be many, many stories that have, you know, that you've heard over the years on how teams have implemented this and what kind of impact it has had. Um, I don't know if there's any specific example that comes to mind for, for this. Uh, well, I mean, there are there are wonderful stories of of teams using this uh, this stuff, and and let's be clear, both pre uh, any work with with us or with this material, because again, if it's a principles based approach, then you know people who were doing it at a world class level, we, we're just kind of revealing to them what they're already doing. We didn't have mm. to invent this stuff; we just needed to go out and see well what's actually working. Um, but there's just wonderful stories. Uh, you know, the, the easy ones are, are kind of around purpose and vision. You know, I, I love that stuff. I always have uh, from my first read of Covey back in the late eighties, you know, that idea of vision and, um, and there's so many amazing stories about vision. I've, I've included, you know, one or two in the book, um, about, you know, one of my, one of my friends and clients who you know set a vision for a, a billion dollar business globally um, from actually quite a small base, like they were a long, long way away from that, uh, and they managed to to do it because they they set a very clear vision, they communicated it very uh, enthusiastically, um, they you know they worked on you know persuasion, they held the vision even in difficult times. Um, you know, th those stories I love, um, but also the really prosaic stuff, 
like what happens on a team when when they agree how they're going to do meetings what happens on a team when they agree how they're going to do communication with each other i mean and there you know one of the stories in the book um is just massive increase in employee satisfaction in the employee mm. engagement survey in the organization when they made these decisions about how they were going to communicate what tools they were going to use what tools they weren't going to use and how they were going to use the tools they decided to use that just you know created a massive increase in in their satisfaction uh, uh, wonderful hmm yeah i had you know that I, I I saw that that tool discussion showing up now in a recent seminar as well. They were using um, a software application for a, a shared overview of projects, but was it a, they, they didn't really give the overview and was it the right channel for the different discussion topics uh, that were going on? Was it for a, an overview? Was it for a next action level? Um, it was very, um, yeah, there were some clarifications uh, needed to, uh, to make that uh, work much more helpful for them. Um, what about the... Um, I suppose if you are a manager and you pick up the the book, um, you can you can read through it, and I, you know, I'm sure some parts of the book will resonate more. And yeah, we need this more than others, so they might be able to to pick that up and, and start at the appropriate level. But what if you're on a team? Um, any tips for anyone out there who are on a team wishing for some aspects of the book more GTD, GTD on a on a team level? Any suggestions on where they could start? Well, I mean, I think you you uh, you would pick up the book, um, and hopefully, in reading it, you would become uh, inspired, and not like uh, some kind of otherworldly experience, but just inspired by the possibility of a new way of working on your team. Um, and and I'm guessing, you know, if if I was picking this up for the first time, looking at it as a team member. Um, I would probably be drawn more to, because that's the nature of being human, uh, drawn more to the things that we're not getting right than the ones that we are getting right. Mm -hmm. um, and But it, it should give you some uh, language and a framework to begin to talk about um, what's going wrong on the team and maybe you know where to start, where, where we should start, where is the high leverage spot for us to start um, so we'll get you know maximum benefit for for the least amount of effort, um, and I think you know, there are things that you could do really quickly. Um, and this is again you know one of the examples from the book is uh, you know foxhole buddies don't need to have a lot of committee meetings about what they're going to do next, right? They just kind of look at each other and go, "This is this is the way we want to do it. Let's do it this way." Um, I think you. you the the problems of doing things differently as a team inside of a larger structure that's not doing them that way are probably overestimated. I mean, I, I don't think anybody mm. really cares as long as you get your work done and you don't have to publicize the fact that you're going to do things differently on your team. I don't think it's worth, you know, going three levels up to find out if it's okay to decide that you're only going to work with, you know, do your meetings at least in a certain way, right? Um, you may need to monitor channels that you as a team are not going to use, but I still think that would cut down the amount of time you spent in the other channels if your team chooses to do things in a certain way. So, um, yeah, there's lots of places that you could start. Um, you could start with, okay, as a team, we're going to start to say no more. Uh, we need to have agreements about, you know, who's saying yes to what, um, whether we need to check with each other before we say yes as individuals to things, because uh, that might just make it impossible for us collectively to get our important work done. Hmm. Yeah, great, great, great reflection. Thanks, Ed. Um, any sort of last tips or you know recommendations for the listeners, viewers out there? What should we have touched on or shared that we haven't already covered? Uh, no, great interview. I'm. I'm. Uh, I mean, I think the the thing to I would love, and you know, both David and I were very keen on this idea of of healthy high performance, because uh, you know the the consequences of our society's obsession with 
performance and and actually kind of mono performance in the financial domain right like we're 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 not measuring performance on on most other metrics actually right we're mm. we're obsessed with financial performance when it's it's abundantly clear that you know financial success is is useful to a certain extent it's also very necessary for human happiness but it's not everything and certainly for for a lot of the world now it's clear that just piling up more stuff is not going to make anybody any happier so i think we need to step away a little bit and work out you know what what is health uh mental physical spiritual and social health um and and how do we want to measure those things so that we actually have um a way of moving forward consistently towards you know human happiness and fulfillment as opposed to just piling up more stuff while we incinerate our environment that's that's just not a great way forwards great thank you thank you so much ed that's a great note to to end on thank you so much for your time thank you to david will send our thanks via email instead uh to him it was great talking to you both and, and again thank you so much both of you for writing the book um i don't know if i can speak for all gtders out there but i'm but i'm almost sure i can uh, thank you so much for writing this book uh, this really is the manual for for gtders out there to navigate by in, in our work with others and perhaps help share gtd with with others around them so thank you so much it means a lot that people like you uh, uh, think it's a good book it's a great book <laughs> thank you <Ed. laughs>that was a good interview um sorry that we had uh, david uh, leaving us uh unfortunately that was not in his hands but um he lo we lost him uh, because of uh, faulty uh, internet he warned us that that might happen so um but thank you for attending david um what was your takeaways Loris, from this interview well just so much good stuff uh, like i say in the interview that really have high hopes high expectations for this book uh, mm. so many many good things in there and really looking forward to hearing you know and it was a how great book not a it good was a book. great book <laughs> it is a great <laughs> Absolutely. book it's a great book we need someone to go out there and make some reviews on amazon and different places to make sure that yes. people know it's a great book <laughs> yeah no but I, I don't know where to start really because there are so many things that people can pick up on. I like the ideas that we spoke about how, of course, you know, obviously if you have a team, if you manage a team, then you can pick this up and, and read through it and figure out. So where would be a good place to start for me? But I also think, you know, Ed covered it nicely saying, so if I'm just on a team, what can I do? Mm -hmm. What, what, how can I go in and, and uh, make some changes to make this work more efficiently? And um, lastly, you know, the, especially the, the last words from Ed on measurements and, and you know, high performance, yeah. how does that actually work? I really, really like that perspective. Hmm. Me too, me too. Um, so our uh, suggestion to you, the listener, is um, go buy the book. It's um, available on, well, uh, well-assorted bookstores everywhere. Uh, Amazon has sells it. It also Audible has the uh, the audiobook. So if you want to listen to that instead, you can actually go to audible.com and create a you know a free account for one credit, and then when you downloaded the book, you can then unsubscribe from the credit. It will not cost you anything. You will get the audiobook for free. Isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but a famous last words from Lars. Will you take us out? I will. Just a quick note that I really, you know, these, uh, I really hope this was a helpful episode for people out there. And, you know, what I'm really curious to hear now when it comes to the book is, so what will the impact be? What will the effect be out there? And so if you read through the book, try some of the things out in your team. If you have any stories, experiences, how will that work for you? Um, I, we would love to share that in the podcast. So be sure to let us know. I've asked this of, you know, all the people in Denmark that I know have the book. I'll ask this to all of our listeners and viewers out there to also share this with us because I would really love to hear. So how does this actually work? What worked well? What was more of a challenge? Um, let us know. Podcast at 
www.thinkdot.dk. Then also, before we wrap up, perhaps we should take the time to wish everyone a great summer, because this will be our last episode before our summer break, and we'll be back in August, if I remember correctly, Morten. That sounds very, very correct. <laughs> and uh, we have um, have uh, you're having a discussion where Lars is thinking maybe we should just do this every month while you're doing it now bi-weekly on the, you know on the regular schedule if you agree with Lars send 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 us an, a message <laughs> if you disagree with Lars send us a message at podcast <laughs> at whitelearning.dk um, so if you want to keep it uh, bi-weekly let us know <laughs> that yes. is true and um, yeah. then the usual wrap up is normally to point you towards gtdsummercamp.com well when this episode is out we have actually just held the GTD summer camp I'm sure it was great we had a lot of fun the <laughs> night people Super. there uh, no doubt <laughs> yeah. I can look into the future that's that's just how it works with GTD um, yeah. so we'll you know of course there will be a summer camp next year as well so be sure to keep out or you know be on the lookout for when we start advertising this sometime after the summer in the mm -hmm. uh, later later this year we also Always wrap up with a quick reminder to head on over to vitallearning.eu because that is where you will find the companies in Norway, Denmark, all across the Nordics Plus um, with the more information about the GTD seminars, the coaching, everything that we do. So vitallearning.eu is the place to go. And if you're outside the Nordics, cruciallearning.com is a good place to go to find your local partner. Yes, and um, we've decided to to ask you, the listener, if you are having um, value from this podcast and would like to connect with Lars or me or both of us, preferably, uh, at LinkedIn, you can. So our suggestion to you is that you follow us on LinkedIn or connect with us. If you decide to connect, please make a, a, you know, a mention in the invitation or that uh, you, for example, GTD podcast is enough, then we understand that you are not a um, uh, spammer <laughs> who want to connect <laughs> with us, but you have a legitimate uh, interest in getting things done. So feel free to connect or follow us. Um, we do, uh, both Lars and me, we, we share things that is mainly getting things done. And uh, hopefully that will be uh, beneficial for you. Indeed. There will be links in the show notes. It will be links in the show notes. And um, well, until next time, after summer, enjoy summer and stay safe and stay productive. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. -bye. Bye,